<clears throat> so going back to this idea now um, of photographing out of the studio and children being able to use cameras and women being able to use cameras, not just professionals doing this. So that very much changed what you could photograph and who was able to photograph. So this is a fantastic album. It's a personal travel album made by the Dowager Empress Maria Fedorinova, showing events in the daily life of the Russian imperial family in 1916. So these are her travel pictures. The travel album. Here you can see there's a picture picture from 1920 in New York of a woman and a dog on a beach and it's very much now that snapshot aesthetic is forming and coming out and you can see Kodak here this is in 1950s and you know the men are photographing a unique situation but they're photographing the family this idyllic family situation um, snapshots tell the story best snapshots keep your happiest times so this idea of capturing memories and documenting your life and your family, but um, I guess what you wanted to represent and depict of this. So with that, I guess this is leading to what is snapshot aesthetic? What is a snapshot aesthetic? So with Kodak's influence, with the camera becoming more accessible and the cameras being less obtuse, you know, they were small, more discreet objects now. So you know, you could, you could photograph things immediately. It was instantaneous, ubiquitous, everyday life. This idea of that it isn't staged in a studio, so it must be real now. Um, so these, you know, you know, you're using cheap and contact, compact cameras, um, and then it's moving to Polaroid and then eventually digital where everyone now has a camera on their phone. Um, so we're going to go through what is this snapshot aesthetic and we're starting off looking at how this came out of America, especially in the um, 1960s. So fine art photography in America and how this snapshot aesthetic became a real thing um, that photographers were working, you know, with off-centered framing, with the banal, with the everyday. So here is an image by Henri Cartier-Bresson um, from 1957. So this is just his work, as you can see here, is in 1936 and around sort of um, early 1960s. So Henri Cartier-Bresson was considered a master of the candid photograph. He pioneered street photography and he was a very early user of 35mm film. He liked to capture on the sly and he liked the camera and the photographer to be unnoticed. He didn't want people sort of to be aware of this caption. He wanted sort of to, to depict things as they were as a sort of sly observer. But he also believed that the photographer did have a creative influence in the depiction of of an image of a photograph. So he believed the creative moment for the photographer was a decisive moment. So he believed there was a fraction of a second where the photographer had to use their intuition and capture that moment through the viewfinder and lens. Um, and this photograph is a great example of that decisive moment being captured um, where it's that perfect, the man is, you know, not touching the ground or the of the water and there's the reflection and it's sort of he's there's that shadow and he's he's captured what he he believes is that decisive moment so just capturing moments but he he's he believes that that the photographer actually has a creative influence just like the painter does so other photographers, this is Walker Evans. He was commissioned by the Farm Security Administration, FSA, 
to capture the effects of the Great Depression, along with other photographers such as Doritha Lang, who used large format view cameras, but he worked with little concern for the ideological agenda that the FSA wanted to capture and push, and instead had his own beliefs about what he wanted to capture and his own intent and interpretation as the photographer. So he had a real desire to capture the ordinary and what he believed was the essence of American life. Helen Levitt, um, she's a noted street photographer who documented New York, in particular the children of New York. She was born in Brooklyn and she was heavily influenced by Cartier-Bresson and Evans, who she, would, who she later became friends with. But she really depicts in her work a sense of place and the everyday urban environment she lived in, um, which was the streets of New York and how that evolved and changed over time. And she became quite dismayed later on saying, you know, there's, you know, where is the life gone? There's, you know, children are not playing on the streets anymore and how this shifted. Um, but it's something that she continued, you can see from the 40s and that image to the 80s in this one. Another photographer from this similar time period here is Lee Friedlander. Um, they were known for photographing fragmented reflections and storefronts, the urban social landscape. His images often contained his own shadow and reflection, so the photographer is present in the photograph and very much acknowledging that in the images, um, what the viewpoints are and um, the image not just being the subjective straight thing. You know, as a, as a his his part of the work and his his perspective is there. Eggleston William Eggleston was known as a pioneer of color photography. Um, he worked primarily with color transparency film in the late sixties and the mid seventies. He started using a dye transfer printing method, which is this hyper saturated amazing color. And you can see here it's that off center framing. You know, this idea of shooting from the hip and, you know, playing with reflections and um, what you can see and what you can't see. You know, lighting and shadows. You know, there's a woman behind looking into the lens. And, you know, he photographed mundane everyday subject matter. So gas stations, diners, parking lots. You know, he considered his framing and lighting in the moments he chose to capture. Here are some Australian examples you know, depicting Australian vernacular. You know, very typical 70s Australia, eight, the 80s, you know, the car and the tallie, you know, here, you know, men drinking beer at a sports event, Fiona Hall, you know, the beach. Bondi, classic. Mervyn Bishop, um, photographs from the 70s. And then um, there's Martin Parr, who captured British modern life and used photography to, to explore the social classes of England. He worked with saturated colour and flash, which is very different to what documentary photographers traditionally do. And he, he had this, um, he used humour as a key strategy within his work, playing with the satirical and looking at modern subjects through the anthropological let sort of, these sort of, you know, people on the beach and, you know, with trash going on these holidays. So he captured this discrepancies of wealth and social classes. And you're very much here, the mundane and, the everyday and the typical, but how he's taken that further. So a very different approach to capturing the everyday in the vernacular is Doug Rickard, who used Google Street View and YouTube to find images, which he then re-photographed on his computer monitor. So 
this one here is from Google Street View where he has the sort of coordinates of the Street View. So he's not actually there being present. He's present at the computer screen finding these moments where you know, Google Street View is, is showing these people and these moments in time.